you are. I said we've got three people who are um, dialing in, so I'm sure they will want to uh, make a contribution as well. Okay, I've just got a, a, a couple of things, so can I welcome you all, uh, obviously, to the uh, meeting. I know we've had a little bit of a bit of confusion around the day because we said we'd meet in a fortnight and obviously it's a fortnight in a day but uh, so apologies for that um clearly uh, it, it is um, the meeting around covid19 and what we're doing and working together now we're responding to that so we'll give everybody a chance to do that uh, there are two uh, ways we we're going to look at the the meeting um, so part one is about that, about COVID-19 and about what our response is now we're dealing with that. And part two was uh, a number of things were on the agenda, uh, Marmot, uh, 10 years on, alcohol minimum pricing. Um, so what I'm going to do is ask just that they be noted and that we can pick them up at a later date because I'm sure um, you know, the issue is an important issue at this juncture is dealing with COVID-19 and our response to it, and we can pick them up uh, at, at a later date, okay? So, uh, as I say, welcome um, to the meeting, everybody. Clearly, uh, since we last met, there's been um, a lot gone on, uh, to say the least. Um, uh, but I think from the city's point of view, I think we are, are dealing with things uh, as well uh, as we could possibly be dealing with it. And I want to uh, pay particular tribute to all of you and all of our staff uh, at, at LCC, but all of you working for each and every one of your organisations because um, it's been quite frankly amazing what we've been doing together. Um, and we're going to need a lot more of that over the next couple of weeks and months. Um, so. Um, as I said, it is, uh, uh, as you know, a, a move and feast. Um, the things for me are, are just quite simply about sometimes how we're having to respond to what governments are asking us to do. Um, you know, somebody was critical of us, uh, of me this morning, for saying that, you know, they weren't told in advance about the school closures. And I said, well, you know, ditto, neither was I. So, you know, it, it is that uh, moving uh, feast and it is about, um, I hate that word, moving feast, but it is a, you know, a, a, a moving theme, if you like, and it changes every single day. Uh, but I think the fact that we had our first Elton Well being board meeting to deal with this, knowing uh, the challenges that we were going to face and are facing, uh, put us in good stead and I think that showed that we were ahead of the curve really in terms of responding and how we're responding and how we're, we're working together and that's exactly what uh, we need to continue to do. You know, it's great that we're, we're, we're here and we are uh, keeping a social distance uh, from people as the guidelines suggest um, and it's right that we do that and, and I think, you know, we will uh, look at how we can connect with each other and whether we reduce uh, the scale of the meeting and whether we need a meeting because we are uh, taking some actions um, on, a, on an almost daily basis. So I know um, my chief executive is here uh, uh, alongside us and he's going to give us uh, an update in terms of what we've responded to and what we are feeding in. And I know a lot of people here are also in the local resilience forum. So it's a question of of, of merging some of that with what, what, what we are doing as well. And uh, Colleen's here, Martin's here, lots of our staff are, are here, but also, as I said, it's good to see you from different agencies. So everybody will get a, a chance to uh, have, have an input, really. So, Tony, I'm going to um, initially just ask you to give us uh, a, a, an update on, on uh, where we are. There's some announcements that, that we will be making, the city, in terms of, you know, we took decisions based on, on government's advice as well to look at our facilities and, and how we're uh, responding to that. We are um, closing our leisure facilities um, as of midnight tonight. Um, we are uh, also looking at our library provision uh, and whether we need to close all of them um, or just have some 
uh, timings where we can keep a couple of them open, say, for instance, where some people can go in from uh, early in the morning, 9 o'clock till 11 o'clock or whatever. We're looking at uh, maintaining central library, but on a reduced footfall, so we reduce the numbers going in. Otherwise, you're going to have massive contact there. So, but, but people need to go online, for instance, to apply for universal credits and stuff. So we've got to be mindful of that. We've got to be mindful of communities and needing some of that support. Our one-stop shops as well, similarly, uh, because of footfall and because of the reductions in staff as well. We've got 30% reduction in our staff at Liverpool City Council at the moment. So we're reducing them uh, as well. We're only probably going to keep a couple of them open. Um, to help with dealing with uh, particular issues that people face. We're announcing the two hotline numbers today. Uh, one is for people to ring in to volunteer. Uh, to We can keep a database then of, of, of people and make sure that they get adequate training and support. But equally, we'll also be having a number, a direct line, where people can ask for support and help as well. Uh, so there are a couple of things that we'll be announcing. And Tony, I said, I think can just keep us up to date uh, with a little bit about uh, what we've been talking with partners about. So over to you, and then I'm going to open it up to uh, everybody to have a, a make a contribution. Okay, so as I said, uh, you will get an opportunity to uh, contribute, and it's important to hear your voice. Hey, thanks, Joe. Um, <clears throat> there's several elements to the work the, the council is doing here. I'll just take them in turn. One is... Um, we're working with our partners at Merseyside Resilience Forum. I know there's people from the forum here today, so I won't go into too much detail there. But the role that local authorities play at a time like this is incredibly important in terms of making sure that, um, that the whole system works properly. And that partnership working, which has been tested over many, many years through sort of exercises, live experience, etc., is really, really important. And it's times like this that all of that exercising, which doesn't always feel like the top priority at the time when there's nothing happening, really does come to the fore. And, uh, and I think we're all really glad that that has been done really dil diligently in Merseyside um, over that period. Um, second issue for us is around social care and health. Um, and it, it's, it's that whole system of making sure the system works properly um, there's two parts to our role as I see it in terms of social care. One is a course in supporting vulnerable people and making sure they're well and they're, they're enabled to live independently, etc., um, as, as is a normal part of social care work. The other side is making sure that the social care system as a whole um, doesn't um, create blockages that enables beds to be freed up in hospitals so more people can be treated as the crisis picks up, if the modelling is as we think it is, and there's going to be real pressure on the NHS. And I think we're planning on the basis that that will be the case. And so getting the social care work right, not just in terms of the council's own services, but the whole supply chain, uh, and that comes back to sort of resourcing, etc. when all organisations are going to be down in terms of staffing numbers, really, really important. The next issue for us, uh, which, as you've touched on, Joe, has come to the fore very quickly, is around the school closures, um, making sure that transition is managed effectively, that um, children who are particularly vulnerable have got pr appropriate support in place that would otherwise have been provided by the schools. Um, really key issue about understanding, the, particularly for an extended period, the, the young people who would have been in receipt of free school meals, making sure that they have appropriate nutrition, etc., and that they, they, you know, not to put too fine a point, are not going to go hungry. Um, really, really important. But of course, in order to assist the whole effort across the whole system, the issue of making sure there's appropriate provision for children, young people from families where there are key workers in that system. There's some announcements going to be made this afternoon by the government on this. As part of the regional work I do on this, and we were on a call until late in the evening with government last night, We've been pushing incredibly hard to make sure that definition of key worker enables our whole system, not just the council, but across the partnership, to function properly and that we've got the capacity in the right places to do that. And the schools then that will remain open, providing that safe and constructive environment for young people to be there, to enable their parents to go and do this work, is really, really important. 
Then we come to the 1.4, 1.5 million people who are in the three categories of people who are particularly at risk that the government are asking to self-isolate for a 12-week period from this weekend. And there's a really important role for us to do with our voluntary sector partners, with other partners, in making sure those people are adequately supported um, so that they can remain uh, out of harm's way over that period is a key part of the national strategy. Um, there's a plan emerging, which is a joint plan between central government and local government to take that forward. Um, we're rapidly mobilising at our end, um, and uh, as you've said, the helplines that you've announced, Joe, that are setting up will be incredibly important as part of that. Um, the key thing for us here is to make sure that all of those people get access to, to food and, and deliveries at home, but also, if this is going to be an extended period, there, there are other needs are met as well in terms of you know, things like social isolation uh, and, and stuff like that. Um, incredibly important that we have volunteers and the voluntary sector working closely with us, but all of that needs to be coordinated. And what we're asking partners is to bear with us as we put that plan in place, which we'll share with everybody over the next few days, because if we have a scattergun approach, there's a high likelihood that people will fall through the net. Um, whereas if we coordinate this through one plan that works seamlessly, um, we can make sure that we, we keep and maintain contact uh, and, and support services with everybody that needs it. I, I have to say the response from um, the vo voluntary sector, Collins here um, in Liverpool, and the amount of volunteering that's already starting to come through is overwhelming, but, but hardly surprising in a city like Liverpool, so, so that's great. And then perhaps the, the boring bit, but really, really important, is our own business continuity plan within the council. The new norm for us, normal business for us, over the next period is managing this. Let's make no bones about it. It is about making sure we're supporting vulnerable people, we're keeping key council functions going, we're able to support the partnership effort, we're able to maintain that close system working between social care and health, and to do that, um, we need to stop doing quite a bit of activity, we need to divert resources, we need to have really robust plans in place which are coming together very rapidly and we're meeting as a senior team on a daily basis uh, and there's a lot of work streams going on behind the scenes on that to rapidly get us to a position where we get into that rhythm of, of, of running our functions in a very different way. And I'm very confident at this stage, despite the fact that this is a major, major crisis we're facing, that across the partnership and within the council, the preparations we're making will stand us in the best position we can be in to tackle what's going to be a very, very difficult period. OK, I, I just want to pick up on, on, on and, it, and it is basically, um, uh, obviously, we, we're going to, it's important for us to understand, you, you know, your own business resilience and how you as organisations uh, 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 cope with um, you know, look, I, I can tell you about the economic impact already that, that uh, this is having on the city. Uh, I can tell you that, you know, probably in relation to, you know, budget pressures, and we haven't even started our budget for 2020-21 yet, but already the budget pressures are well in excess into double figures and, and likely to get uh, a lot higher. But as the Chief Executive pointed out, my message, and it's supported by... Uh, Councillor Kemp and Councillor Crone uh, and Councillor Radford is that uh, basically what needs to be done for the people of this city will be done and we'll worry about the cost of it at a later date. It's that important to us that the health of the people of this city comes first. Nobody will go hungry, no one will be left isolated and whatever support we need to give, we will give. I give that promise, so do the Cabinet and so do everybody uh, involved with LCC. So uh, on that base, I'm going to now ask Colleen, whether uh, there's any contribution you want to make in relation to what Tony said, and then I'm going to uh, ask uh, Dr. Coffey um, and then uh, Stephen uh, from Stephen Henry from uh, CCG, um, Debbie Heron from the Royal, uh, Ermi Das from Alder Hay, um, Steve and Martin Farron, if they want to make a contribution, plus those that have dialed in, we're then going to go. Uh, to ask you, do you want to make a contribution on what you've just heard uh, from everybody else? Okay, I'm not going to keep you till the end because you're going to make sure you get uh, your contribution in. So, Colleen.
Um, okay, thank you. Thank you, Mayor Anderson. Um, just quickly building on a little bit of what Tony said and just to, to obviously explain it to, to people who might be watching. Um, working with the Merseyside Resilience Forum, we are meeting on a weekly basis with partners across Merseyside at both a strategic and, if you like, an operational or tactical level. And that is to ensure that not only our business continuity plan in Liverpool City Council is robust and, and ensure, ensures that we deliver essential services, but that those are dovetailing with those of our partners to make sure that we don't have any gaps between our services and that we are able to meet the city and the wider, wider residents and communities and businesses particularly needs. So that, those meetings are taking place and we regularly um, contribute to those and they inform our business continuity plan, which Tony alluded to. We have already, as Tony mentioned, exercised and undertaken a significant amount of pre preparation over the course of years in terms of our emergency planning to identify what are the core and critical services that we need to sustain to make sure that we continue to serve the most vulnerable people in our community and to keep the city going. And those, those essential services um, have been identified. We are allocating resources to those and we are reallocating resources from those non-essential services um, as we speak. You mentioned already one of the closures around leisure centres. Those staff will be diverted to other essential services. So we are moving our, our staff and very much with the cooperation and willingness of our staff to, to assist the, the city. Moving on to, to some of the, the detail around the community plan, and you, you mentioned, Mayor Anderson, the, the announcement of the two helplines of people who might need support um, being launched today, but also the where people want to help, and that's individuals as well as community groups and community organisations. And we've been wor working very closely with Colin Heaney and LCVS to develop that and, and uh, put that both on telephone as well as an online system so people can refer someone that they might have concerns about as well. We're asking um, a number of the street-based, community-based groups that have self-mobilized to also register for those lines because what we want to do is, as part of our community resilience plan, our key aspect is making sure that people have information and the most up-to-date information in place so this is about getting information out, but also understanding the support that's there and where we can refer people to. It's also about supporting those localized community groups and those street-based good neighbor um, big groups where somebody might have additional needs that they aren't able to, to respond to, that they have somewhere to refer those people to. So we are um, communicating that as part of our community plan. We have a number of significant, um, of, of our large volunteer organizations, voluntary and community organizations across the city who have stepped forward and will be part of the community plan. I won't name them all because it, we would be here for a number of <laughs> amount, but it's absolutely mobilized and they will be integrated and again, we will be launching that. So I, I will leave it there, Mayor Edison, but help you to take any questions from people later on. I, I just want to make a comment, really, because I know it's being dealt with, but it's just to reassure people that things are being dealt with. And that is, you know, it's absolutely essential that, that the volunteers are coordinated because there's a risk uh, to not only people who are volunteering, but equally to the people who are in receipt of, of that. And whether we like it or whether we don't, I'm sure the police uh, would support this view. If it's not coordinated, it leaves it open to people to target vulnerable people in order to take advantage of them. So it's important that we uh, coordinate and lead uh, the way. And we urge all of the voluntary sector to bear with us in that and to actually support us doing what we're doing. The other issue, and, and I know, uh, Colleen, you are, uh, I know Tris in, in my office is working with you and dealing with this, is the issue around the food banks. A lot of the uh, voluntary food banks and stuff are run by people who've got you know, issues themselves that are usually uh, very elderly uh, with, with some medical issues and problems as well. So I think we're looking at coordinating that a little bit more so that we can support things across uh, the city. And we'll have some further announcements to make uh, over the next few days on that and indeed even over the weekend as, as, we, uh, as we sort things out with that. Yeah. If I may, absolutely, on, on the food banks. We are establishing a, a clear kind of food plan to understand who is already using our food banks and where that demand is and where even some of those specialist 
uh, groups that we've got in our community that, that may um, already be accessing that kind of level of support. What I would say is absolutely in terms of the individuals volunteering, it, a lot of this might ask, be asking individuals to contribute to existing organizations like the food banks to provide that additional support. So individuals volunteering are absolutely going to be matched to that resource as well as other community organizations. And can I just make one plea as well that on behalf of the City Council we make contact with the uh, supermarkets to make sure that they are uh, addressing the issue of, of people you know, just being ridiculously stupid in, in stockpiling uh, and disadvantaging uh, elderly people. I know it's a frustration for all of us to see uh, what's going on. Uh, across the city, but I think a message from us to them to say we expect you to do that, even if you're only letting 20 in at a time or 30 in at a time. You know, the, the the bottom line is that some people are going to those supermarkets every single day and finding that there's nothing there, and and it, it's wrong. That means key workers and people who are in work, people who've got whatever, can't get uh, the the stuff that they require. So we've got to look at that as well. I'm now going to, because um, unless there's any questions for Tony or Colleen uh, from anybody, um, yeah, do you want to ask a, a question? Just yeah. for the, the sake of the, the video link, if you, we just say who we are, yeah? Uh, Councillor Tom Crone, St Michael's Ward. Um, just to say I'm massively support the, everything the Mayor's done and the senior management and all the staff. Uh, in preparing for this. But just in terms of the coordination, from a, a councillor point of view, um, obviously I'm working with community groups and stuff like that to build up a response. Something that I'd find really useful would be um, one specific contact in the council that I could always just ring and just run things by and check I'm doing things right. So something, uh, just one person for me to call would be really useful. Um, so, I don't know, is there a council lead on this? Is there an individual who's responsible for overseeing the whole response? And secondly, just more information about supporting um, families with children with free school meals. How do we get hold of those vouchers? Okay, well, the contact, Colleen, if you, especially with being a councillor of the council, Colleen is your contact and she will uh, then advise you. With regards to the vouchers, as kids, um, I'll, I'll let, not that I don't know what I'm doing, but I'll, I'll let Steve, Steve Reddy, the director, explain to you what we are doing with regards to the food vouchers. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor Anderson. Um, I would aware that the Department for Education have, have contacted uh, schools saying they should uh, go out and procure their own vouchers, but the council was already on with procuring a huge amount of vouchers for main supermarkets already, and I'm just checking emails now that that's all been agreed. Guidance has been sent to all schools, and we'll be putting it through our comms team onto the council website about how those uh, vouchers, I think they're around £10 a week per child, can be accessed, and in our city, uh, there's 16,000 children. So, so we, we, we think kids are going to be informed with letters tomorrow as well from most of the schools and told that uh, we can access them through the children's centres and stuff. That's, we're looking at how that logistic is, is done to make sure that those that need to be informed are informed. We'll do it on our own websites, on our Twitter feed, on our Facebook page. And of course, through the councillors, it's important that you can feed some of that back through as well. Um, but as Steve said, we were thinking well in advance of the, uh, the decision and we were planning this. So that's why we are, uh, as I said, well advanced in, in, in this as well. So is that okay, Tom, yeah? Okay. So my understanding is as well that the vouchers can be used um, online with the numbers on them so we can make sure that that's right because some people will be completely locked down in their, in their homes and it's for initial four weeks, isn't it, Steve? So we've got the whole thing ready and signed off for, for the next four weeks. We'll see how that goes. Okay, absolutely. Um, so that's fine. So I'm now going to then... Um, I, I, I think unless there's... Um, I'm, I'll stick with this sort of list of people I've got here. So it's in no particular order. I don't want anybody to feel uh, that you're, you're in a pecking order here because you are not. 
you are equally as important as, uh, as, as anybody else. Okay, so um, I think we've got Fiona. Um, I, I said Stephen uh, was here, but Fiona has, has, has arrived and safe and well. And so Fiona from the Clinical Commissioning Group. Um... Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Anderson. Um, okay, so I'm here on behalf of the NHS um, in Liverpool um, to update you. Um, we are receiving guidance on a daily, sometimes hourly basis um, from um, the centre. Um, as I said last time, we are in a level four major incident and NHS England are in a command and control response. So everything is being coordinated centrally. Um, the most up-to-date guidance that we had came on the 17th of March. This was for the system generally, which was asking um, us to prioritise certain things, and that would be um, freeing up the maximum possible inpatient and critical care capacity, preparing for and responding to the anticipated very large numbers of COVID-19 patients who will require respiratory support, and to support staff and maximise their availability. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of that because my um, provider colleagues are here to do that. Um, there's also about our part in the wider population measures um, newly announced, um, which I think Dr Coffey's going to cover. Um, and then about um, stress testing our operational readiness. Um, the CCG and all of the partners in Liverpool have taken part in a desktop um, preparedness exercise this week, which has been run centrally. And then also about removing routine burdens um, to facilitate this work. So that is um, reducing inspections and mon performance monitoring and the, the like. Um, we've also had um, assurances about additional funding to cover the additional costs of responding as a health service to the corona emergency. Um, what I wanted to focus on mainly was um, the primary care response, um, because you, you'll hear from my colleagues about um, hospital services. So I thought I was up to date, and the latest guidance came in just an hour before I left the CCG, so I brought it with me. Um, it is essentially giving primary care um, six um, urgent priorities. Um, most of which I'm pleased to say that our system was, is already getting on with. Um, so our practices have already moved um, in the whole to a total triage system, which means that they are only taking contacts with patients over the phone or online. Um, the, practice, the picture across practices, I would say, is variable. So the, the variation in practice size has an impact on their resilience. Um, and some of the smaller practices will find it more difficult if they lose staff to, to, to cover. Um, at the moment, I would say that most practices are still doing some routine work, um, mainly on the telephone, um, and still seeing some face-to-face -face patients who, with non-infective conditions. Um, for managing patients who do have infection symptoms, um, the advice is still to contact 111. Although increasingly we are encouraging patients who are otherwise fit and healthy with no significant symptoms to just follow the national guidance and self-isolate and get their advice online. Um, our practices are, um, have all been given guidance on infection control and the and supplies of personal protective equipment. There is um, some national debate about personal protective equipment and we're working with practices to make sure that they've got what they need, although that is being coordinated nationally. Um, practices are making plans for managing patients in isolation areas as best that they can. Um, increasingly, we're supporting practices and our CCG staff to work remotely um, where possible. Um, we have got our primary care networks are talking to each other. All practices have a buddy practice to help them with their resilience, but what we have realized is that actually a buddy of two or a group of two is not enough to keep our resilience going. And um, so our primary care networks are having further conversations about how we perhaps more significantly reconfigure primary care access across the city on, on larger footprints. And that is one of the six priorities that the NHS England have asked us to focus on. Um, 
I think our next major challenge is going to be a significant increase in the number of patients who are going to need to be seen at home. Um, and this is going to be very difficult because at the same time as the requirements, the numbers of patients needing to be seen at home increases, our workforce is decreasing. So I speak in personally from my own practice today, we have got two GPs off already, got one nurse off and um, it would it, it is happening very quickly. Um, so those conversations are taking place at primary care network level. Um, we have... Um, uh, we are going to be asked to um, support particular groups of patients at the highest risk and the NHS is going to be writing directly to all these patients. Um, for example, this is dialysis patients or transplant patients, they're the very, very serious and complex um, patients. The other patients in the, the high risk groups are being asked to follow the national guidance. Um, System-wise, um, Liverpool CCG are coordinating um, a system, the system response. We have an incident response room at the CCG to support all NHS partners, so primary care and our hospital colleagues and our community services. Um, the account, Jan Ledward, the accountable officer at the CCG, is um, leading a teleconference with the chief execs across the city three times a week. The chief operating officers are speaking daily on a teleconference and we're having three times a week primary care teleconferences. Um, the last thing that I, I would want to say really on behalf of the NHS would be um, obviously thank you to all of our staff who are working incredibly hard and um, will continue to do so. But what the NHS needs more than anything at the moment is for people and the public to take this very seriously um, and follow the social distancing advice and do that from now, um, not thinking that, oh, it's all right at the moment, I'll do it from next week. It may sound overly dramatic, but doing it now will reduce the number of deaths that, are, that w will happen. Um, and the other bit of a request really is that not to contact the NHS unless you really have to. Anything that you can self-care for, please do. Um, and be patient with, with your NHS. It's working really hard um, and we will do our best for you. Okay, um, yeah, Richard. <laughs> One question to uh, Fiona. It, it would appear that a lot more people have already had the coronavirus than appear in, in the official figures because they've had a bit of a sniffle and that's been the effect on them. And it's very important that we try and test them as soon as possible, because then they should be able to go back into the workforce because uh, presumably they built up the antibodies. So what are the plans, if any, at this stage for testing people who may already have had it so that we can do that? Uh, and the second thing, which is really a question to, to you, Joe, but it arises uh, about, uh, from what Fiona said about social... Uh, distancing is do we have any powers as a licensing authority to deal with some of the irresponsible places that have just been opened and cramming and ramming people in I know what the temptation why they're doing it but they need to stop and do we have any powers to help make them stop you want to respond to them? Can I just okay. remind people as well? Just, just please say who you are, just because it's not for me. It's for for people who are. This is being live streamed. So, uh, do I look alright, by the way? Fiona. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so on the testing, that's very much being led nationally. Um, and there is, I, I am aware of a lot of the debate and a lot of the concern, particularly about testing health staff. We are told that in the guidance there is going to be a significant ramping up and that there is going to be more local testing available. But what we don't know yet is what that actually means in terms of numbers and how we do it, unless Ema um, has a better answer than that. Email. 
that, that, that was a big kerfuffle to say no. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> but in terms of um, in terms of yes, there are plans to ramp up testing at a national um, level, and as as uh, Dr. Lemons has pointed out, um, testing of frontline healthcare workers is uh, is a top priority once we have the capacity. And, and a, a serious concern, and a lot of questions are being asked about it. And you know, it, it, I guess you can only do what, what what you've got in terms of capacity and test and equipment. But but it, it's important. Um, yeah, Barry. Yeah, just to underline, I think it's frustrating. And for you all. are Barry. I am yeah. Councillor Barry Kushner, a cabinet member for Children's Services. Um, yeah, I think it's frustrating to all of us in this room, the response that the government has made uh, irresponsibly, in my view, to, to testing. I think, uh, I don't know how you can manage a pandemic without data, but um, I think to ex the extension of you know, the, I think what the government announced yesterday was for 25,000 tests per day in, hospital, in hospitals, but I think there's an issue around testing anyone who is going to be visiting home visiting essentially those people who are at home, whether it's adult social care, children's social care. And, and I think that, that probably needs that. I don't know what the government guidance is on that, but I, I think that needs to be, they need to bear that in mind. And also temperature testing, whether that is something that is relevant for us to be doing as a, a guide in the absence of other things. Uh, in, in the city and also whether if we've got volunteers and we're, some of them will be doing deliveries or adult social care workers or people doing home visits whether they require uh, any PPE and whether what sort of guidance there is really uh, around that. Okay well I, I, I think on, I'll, I'll bring in just a second but just in, in, in terms of on the, on the, the, the point about, about the uh, social isolation and stuff and people making contact with people delivering for instance you know support volunteers I think you know it, it's again social distance isn't it so knock on the door leave whatever you bring in or whatever and keep your distance that sort of thing um, but it is you know and, and I guess in some senses it, it's difficult for Fiona or, or anybody else to uh, give uh, a sort of definitive response on the testing issue because we are reliant on, on central government to make that capacity available, whether it's in testing equipment or people to test. You know, uh, for, for me, for instance, there's not just a question of the patients being tested or the workforce being tested. The workforce needs to be tested because they then go home to families who maybe will have vulnerable people within those families. So they have to be tested because it's, it's incumbent on us to make sure that they're safe we're sending loved ones out to work in the nhs and then coming back into our homes and stuff with potentially having the virus and not being tested and allowing them back into the house so you know it, it is a, a, an issue that the more the pressure and the more government respond to this it will be uh, helpful and then just the last point richard asked the question about our licensing system unfortunately I know that our licensing system won't help us deal uh, with that particular issue, Richard, because all we do is grant a license to, for instance, operate or, or sell. It is incumbent on the government to actually reinforce uh, the restrictions in a way. For instance, like we, we are closing our leisure centres and our gymnasiums down today because we think that's the right thing to do because they are a hotbed where you can pass on infection. And, and if government don't take action to close down the private sector gymnasiums, then are we wasting our time? So it has to be coordinated by central government as well, and we expect them to respond, uh, I think, shortly, uh, as they are always a bit behind the curve here. But it needs to be done, I, I, I agree with you. Otherwise, you're just going to get people that aren't following the advice, what Fiona is rightly saying. And finally, I would say to you and to any health professional, We've got our own video here. And if you want to make an appeal to people to follow that advice and guidance, we'll make sure that we get it out on our Facebook and Twitter page because I want them to listen to me and I want them to listen to you, more importantly to you, because you're the person who can give that advice and they should listen to. So maybe we can do that at the end and we'll get that transmitted this evening. Um, you can just again remind people who you are and stuff. Certainly. Thank you. Ian Buchan, University of Liverpool. Um, to answer the Councillor's question on 
Is there a test at the moment for people who've had coronavirus and, and recovered? Uh, there is no test at the moment, but Public Health England are working on one, which underlines the, the importance of everyone doing everything they can uh, to prevent unnecessary mixing, to control the spread of the virus. There are people out in the pubs at the moment. There's everything the community can do uh, to, to stop that mixing now. Um, there's a lot of research happening at the University of Liverpool, for example, uh, internationally, nationally, and, and locally. Louise, I, I'm conscious uh, <coughs> Professor Louise Kenny is on the line and wanted to come in, I think, on the testing issue. Yeah, I just think it's worth bearing in mind some of the logistical challenges around the test, right? So, as Ian has said, there is no test to uh, tell us whether anyone has been exposed and is now immune or whether someone hasn't been exposed and is therefore susceptible. The only test is available is a test to say that you are actively shedding the, vi uh, the virus. That test is called PCR. It's incredibly time consuming and labor intensive. and can only be done with a certain, with one specific platform in the UK at the current time, although we are looking to widen the number of platforms that can run that test. Um, so I think even if all the money in the world were available right now, there is a logistical bottleneck with testing um, the company that make the platform that runs the test cannot make any more platforms. They are maxed out. There is a global demand around the world for this specific PCR machine. So um, I, 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 hear the, I hear the anxiety around testing, but I think for the foreseeable future, testing is going to be limited. And, and as Fiona has pointed out right now, we can't even test frontline healthcare workers, which is a real challenge because uh, several of my colleagues, uh, including someone who's on the line, are self-isolating at home. Uh, because they, they, there isn't a test available. So it, it's, not a, it's not a question of um, resource. It's a, a logistically very difficult, challenging test to perform. Okay, just, just before uh, I, uh, Louise, ask you then if you want to make a contribution whilst you uh, are, are talking anyway, can I just ask a question then? Because uh, a couple of my colleagues have pointed out to me that um, uh, we've had conversations with officials from Shanghai uh, government who, who were talking about whether potentially uh, we could buy equipment off them. My recollection of how the Chinese dealt with this or whatever and just going on news reports was that they had available equipment and, and, and testing that was done within you know, something like uh, 24 hours, a turnaround of 24 hours. Are you, are you hearing anything about this? Do you know whether that's the case or true? Because um, clearly, you know, uh, that's what I recall uh, the reports given news uh, details on, on, you know, the main BBC and stuff saying it's getting such a quick turnaround. Um, are we wrong? Was that not right? So we are aiming to turn the tests around. Uh, no, my, my, my question was, though, Louise, I accept that. What we, but was, were you, are you aware of this equipment that, that, that was available? So there are four elements to the test. Firstly, there are the NHS trained staff um, to take the actual samples. It's a relatively straightforward procedure, but you do need to be adequately skilled and trained, particularly in the donning and doffing of PPE. Secondly, there is the platform on which the test is run. We are currently working with the NHS and, in fact, the Army to, um, to do a nationwide requisition of all spare P PCR platforms uh, to make them available to the NHS. These platforms exist in science labs all over the country, so we're working to uh, collate that inventory and get them sent to uh, the required locations in the next 24 hours. Secondly, there's the consumables, and I think that's what the Chinese are talking about. They scaled up the consumables for this test at speed. Right now, consumables, as I understand it, are not the bottleneck. And then the final piece of the equation are the skilled laboratory technicians to run the test. So there are four elements, and fixing one won't fix the, the supply problem. Uh, there are All four elements need to be in place. And the current bottleneck are the actual platforms. Uh, you can't make a PCR machine overnight. A 3D printer can't make this machine. It's a very complex platform. Certainly in China, I think they do have the capability to make these platforms at speed and at scale. Um, but even if we fix that, we've still got an issue with laboratory staff, adequately, uh, adequately trained um, laboratory staff. Uh, Public Health England and the NHS are working on nothing else 
and I'm getting emails about this on an hourly basis. So there is a national a national drive to scale up the testing. Um, but at the moment, we are restricting it to people who are actively express actively showing symptoms, therefore expressing the virus, and who are unwell unwell enough to demand testing. Otherwise, the most effective public health measure we can take is, as uh, Professor Bocken outlined, anyone with any symptoms should follow PHE advice and self-isolate. That is the single most biggest thing we can do to flatten the curve and protect our NHS. Okay, Louise, is there anything then, then you, you, whilst you have uh, the floor, uh, if you like, is you anything else you want to, on the basis of what we've said, or make a contribution yourself? Um, yeah, so just from the University of Liverpool perspective, I just wanted to let you know uh, what we and our partners in uh, the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine are doing. So right now we have uh, three main priorities. One is uh, to support our COVID research programme. Secondly is to support our NHS, our number one stakeholder. And thirdly, we want to support our amazing city. Um, we have um, over 120 COVID researchers uh, working uh, in Liverpool. Uh, they've coalesced around this, and it is the only research programme that we are still running. We've closed down everything else, or by Friday, we'll have closed down every other research programme, and all of our resource and effort is going into our COVID research programme. We are working predominantly on three main areas. One is better understanding the disease. Secondly, is better understanding effective drug treatments. And thirdly, uh, our vaccine programme in addition to uh, colleagues from public health looking across the city at how uh, public health interventions can actually decrease uh, the community spread of this condition. Uh, in terms of supporting our NHS, we've actually um, undertaken a range of measures, uh, which I think some of our NHS partners in the room uh, may be able to speak to. Um, we have, for example, allowed um, LUH uh, NHS workers to use our car parks. Uh, we obviously co-located with Clatterbridge uh, and LUH, so we're, we're allowing them to use our car parks. Uh, our own clinical academics have been um, instructed to, uh, to prioritise their NHS work, and many academics who haven't been particularly active in the NHS in uh, recent years, myself included, will be returning to the NHS workforce in the coming weeks. Um, we are um, corralling all our equipment, uh, things like oxygen compressors, ventilators, um, anaesthetic machines that are used for uh, non-human clinical use. Uh, we're procuring them uh, and sending them to our NHS partners. Um, we also have um, uh, our student accommodation, which is now largely empty, which we're making available to NHS workers. You'll have seen on the BBC website that our final year medical students have joined the NHS workforce as student volunteers ahead of becoming uh, F1s as soon as we can graduate them, which I imagine will be within the next month. Um, and finally, we have an amazing army of volunteers, uh, including our including a, hundred, a thousand other NA, um, medical students who are all DBS checked, who will be volunteering within the NHS. Everything from offering child childcare services and babysitting services to hard pressed NHS workers, uh, all, all the way through to volunteering in uh, non urgent clinical areas uh, within the NHS throughout the city. We've also started to talk about the rest of our uh, five thousand staff members, uh, who have all uh, many of whom have expressed an interest in helping the city at this time. Um, they are keen to particularly help uh, vulnerable parts of the city, including those uh, vulnerable citizens who are self-isolating um, and distrib uh, food distribution, feeding kids, looking after the elderly. Um, but we'll be in touch with uh, Tony Reeves' office about that in the next 24 hours. Ian is actually, Professor Buckins actually in the room. I don't think, I, have I missed anything out, Ian, from a public health perspective? Oh, you, you've covered it all, uh, Louise, but on, on just on, this, on the keeping physical distance, but social cohesion across communities, uh, not just people with symptoms, but all of us avoiding unnecessary contact as we may be infectious and not realize it. Uh, we can all play our part by avoiding that unnecessary trip on public transport, the unnecessary contact with people at shops, when you didn't need to go um, and the pubs are still in use when there's a clear direction not to use them. So all of our communication channels to get a strong public spirit to prevent that unnecessary mixing will help uh, the NHS and the whole of society.
on behalf of uh, the city, uh, Louise, and, 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 and clearly, you know, on behalf of uh, the staff of LCC, you know, that is, uh, you know, breathtaking what um, you do in, in response and on behalf of everybody, thank the volunteers and the staff for everything that, that you do. And, and, you know, it gives me great comfort to know that, um, you know, that spirit that we have in this city is coming to the forefront now. And uh, it gives me real hope that we'll not only get through this, but get through this with great pride in, in what we've achieved. So thank you and pass that uh, message, please, on to the Vice Chancellor, but on to everybody that you are in contact with, please. And I'm more than happy to uh, come and speak to people, but thanks so much for everything that you, you, you're doing. Um, okay, so let's... Um, just move uh, around a little bit then and I think um, uh, Trish we haven't got a picture of you on on your on the screen but I know how uh, wonderfully beautiful you are and um, and you will make a fantastic contribution so if we go to you next you were asleep then weren't you I can see you <laughs> <laughs> can if, you hear me Anderson? if you go next Trish yeah can you can we you can hear me? yeah we can hear loud and clear uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, just to update from Merseycare, uh, so that's a mental health and community uh, trust across Liverpool, Sefton and wider Merseyside. Um, we are um, in full business continuity position, so we're rapidly mobilising our business continuity plans um, and looking at diver diverting resources uh, based on risk assessment and also staff availability. We have introduced a battle rhythm within the organisation of strategic and tactical command, uh, playing a full role with Merseyside Resilience Forum and across the system. In terms of update from our last meeting at the Health and Wellbeing Board, where we um, updated on psychological support, so we have enhanced our digital offer 24-7 for communities. There's some media and social media going out on this. Um, big issue for us, of course, is um, managing the anxiety of our staff and supporting them, making sure the messaging is right. Um, we, the big concern for staff has been PPE and the availability of it. We have received deliveries of PPE um, today. Um, clearly, we are escalating this uh, every day nationally, but we are receiving PPE deliveries and we have adequate supply as we stand at this minute. We've set up a helpline for staff um, with any queries. As other people have said, guidance is changing quite quickly and therefore making sure the message is clear uh, is a task for all of us. The helpline for staff uh, seems to be um, supporting that. Um, we are looking at, um, with our CCG colleagues and local authority colleagues, some of our services, for instance, walking centres and looking to see whether a remote um, digital um, clinical triage model um, may be suitable going forward. And just trying to support our staff in, in every way we can and play the role uh, that we need to play in the whole system. I'm very happy to take uh, some questions if, from anybody uh, that's there, Mayor, Mayor Anderson. Um, so, so just, just, just a question from, from me, because, uh, but it's not necessarily just for um, uh, Maisie Care, but, uh, and, uh, but it's just to, for you know, our clinical commissioning groups as well, and the GP practices. I know uh, the switch into uh, triage and, and basically... Um, uh, uh, that appointment system whilst we're here I've just received a text from my surgery uh, telling me but at, the, at this current moment I'm, I'm receiving uh, some treatments um, from the walk-in centre um, and basically I was a little bit shocked on two occasions on Saturday and Sunday um, a guy presented himself was tight one diabetes really vulnerable uh, was struggling uh, to breathe was clearly uh,
coffin and, and stuff. It was in front of me. And then when he got to the front, he was, you know, he gave his symptoms in and said that, you know, he thinks he's got uh, the problem. He turned up, but was just told to go and sit, you know, and someone would call him. Um, I guess that shouldn't have happened. Are we, are we trying to make sure that not only the patients, but our staff know? Is there any way that within the walking centres there is a sort of an isolation room or whatever that you can, you know, send people to or ask people to go to? whilst somebody does come out and assess them or something. It was just, it happened on Saturday and Sunday this week. Um, and, you know, obviously I've seen it first hand, so it was me who witnessed it. I'm just asking, are we, is there anything that we're doing um, to make sure that those that are on the reception who take the details can, can make sure that that happens? So, so Mayor Anderson, all of our walking centres have isolation facilities. They are all supported by infection control advice. They're present uh, or available to be present if required. Um, the guidance around walking centres basically has been to stay open. Uh, we think that will change now and we will look at the model uh, which will follow similar to uh, general practice. That obviously has to be agreed with uh, commissioners, etc. But we, will, we are working that up as we speak. Uh, in terms of going back to your point about isolation, every walking centre has an isolation facility and every walking centre has infection control advice and support. Well, I, I don't want to dob anybody in, in it, Trish, but, but, you know, I have and, uh, you know, I'm just mentioning it because I used it. It didn't happen on Saturday and Sunday. So, you know, um, I'm just pointing it out. I was a bit, you know, shocked because it was, um, you know, the, the woman on the reception said, OK, OK, mate, go sit down. Someone will be with you in a minute. And then, you know, he waited for about 20 minutes before three hours called them in. So it clearly didn't happen, Trish. So... Um, I, I accept your point that it should, but um, if we can just make sure that those things are happening, and I apologise if I've dropped some more in it. But, uh, but thank you for the feedback. Um, but it is important, isn't it? Because, you know, I, I think we are getting people, or we were getting people who were presenting themselves with those, you know, uh, those issues, and, 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 and seriously shouldn't have been there, really. They should have been, you know, dealt with. Um, but, but other than that, Trish, I can report that the service was excellent and I'm, I'm fitting well and doing well. And thank you so much for, for what's being done. All right. Thanks, Trish. Thank um, any questions for Trisha from any, anybody? Uh, to Fiona, respond first. Um, so the most important message would be to um, ask patients to, and we do this all the time anyway, is to request the repeat prescriptions um, in a timely fashion. Most practices need 48 hours to be able to generate a, a repeat prescription. Um, so ask for it early. We are asking practices not to give extra supplies to prescribe as normal because if we start patients start stockpiling their medication, then we'll have the same problem as we're having with the supermarkets. Um, practices are now, or should be, all taking tel uh, repeat prescription requests over the telephone, um, rather than asking patients to um, either write it down or to go online to do it. Um, most of the chemists do do a home delivery service, um, although a lot of the smaller chemists are... Um, uh, not open on a Saturday and a Sunday. Um, I will pick that up and go back when, in our incident room, um, or Stephen will write it down, he's sitting behind me, to make sure that we have a think about um, pharmacies at the weekend. Um, but we do have PC24 um, through 111 have an emergency supply um, service, so if patients do run out of critical medication, they should contact 111. Okay. Are you okay with that response, Trish? Yes, thank you. My okay, that's great. So if uh, um, I'm then going to bring um, Sarah in um, from Health Watch. Sarah, do you want to uh, make any comments? Can, can you hear us? Can you hear me now? Can you hear you now? I don't know if you can hear me. I don't know if we, my mic... we can. We can hear you loud and clear. Okay, thanks. 
Um, yeah, we've all moved to home working. We've suspended any of our activities that might put more strain on services. So any entrance view visits, anything like that, we would have been doing. Sarah, can and I ask just, you to? Can I just ask you to sort of sit back a little bit because it's a bit too close to the mic. I think that's fine because okay. we can hear you. Okay. So we're just trying to work out what we can best do. So partly that's about sharing information with people, um, collecting updates on what services are still doing what, amending the Livewell directory, sharing information with the link workers and VP practices and things like that. We're still running our inquiry service, but we're just doing all of that remotely. And um, we're trying to do our best to keep to the social distancing um, and to avoid putting any pressure on services. But it's all we're doing what we can, and it's just channeling the concerns from the, the community. And I said the council's um, updated information on the website has been really useful, and we've been directing lots and lots of people towards that. Okay, well, and that's good. Any questions for for Sarah? Any comments or any questions? And uh, but you're going to stay on on the, uh, the 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 line anyway, and listen to uh, the rest, David. I'm going to come to you next as well. Um, are you okay? Can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Thanks, Mayor Anderson. Can you hear me? Then clear. Super. I I don't have much more to add other than what Louise and Ian have said. I guess what, what we've we've been looking at the literature that's come out of places like China around the response in other countries. One of the, one of the issues, one of the emergent issues, is around digital resilience and the extent to we we can we can move. All the structures of society are online, and at the moment, this meeting is being conducted through my research team's Zoom accounts. And I'd, in order to support social distancing, you know, the extent to which the council and all and all organisations can move to these type of meetings, I think that's I think that putting that infrastructure in place at this stage is is really really important. Uh, there are discussions ongoing around how the university can support in terms of modelling uh, the pressure points that we're going to be seeing across health services, community health services and primary care. Our team have, have been thinking about impacts, particularly on children and, and the, the child public health response that, that's required. Steve Reddy has already pointed out that we've got 16,000 kids who are on free school meals. I think it's, it's very profound what's happening with the schools and the potential impact on mental health for families and thinking about innovative ways that we can support children through this difficult period and other vulnerable groups is, uh, is, is, is really, really important. Uh, I'd stress the importance of the social distancing measures once again and, and, and the measures that are coming through Public Health England. Okay, no, well, I, pre I appreciate that, and um, thanks for those comments, David. And um... hi, David, it's uh, Councillor Jane Corbett here. Um, just in, on the on the back of your research on universal credit and the mental health and stress uh, that you, Margaret, and others put together, um, is there any chance that you can, with everybody else, put massive pressure with us on the government to release more money for people on welfare, and particularly impacting on? On children. So, for example, if child benefit was increased dramatically now as an emergency measure, that would make a big difference. And obviously, the whole uh, benefit system. But if we could do something collectively with the mayor on that, I think it would be very powerful from coming from yourselves. And then you've got a, a thousand volunteers that Louise has at her fingertips who could sign up to that as well, which would be great. And then they have to do something for people as well as businesses. Okay, Dave. Thanks. Thanks, Jane. Thanks, Councillor Corbett. Yeah, we're we're very keen to turn our thinking to to these type of issues. We, you know, we've we've shown in this paper recently that the devastating impact universal credits had on mental health. Uh, I, I think the the secondary impacts, the lo the long term impacts of of the pandemic in terms of deteriorating social conditions for families across the country places like Liverpool that are very much going to be at the sharp end of that. I think that's all all critically important that we start thinking through that now, uh, tracking those impacts and, you know, and doing the research that's going to make a difference to, to policy. So happy to speak about that, Jane. Um, thanks for, for, for that, um, for, for, for that 
comment as well, David. Um, I'm now going to take um, uh, Amy from Alder Hay and then uh, Debbie uh, from the Royal. Amy. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank all of you for the great partnership of colleagues across uh, the Liverpool, Mercy and Cheshire region in a system-wide approach. And thank you also very much for the support around the closure of schools which you have provided. So at Alder Hay, our priority is actually all children with any urgent concern that they are seen wherever they may be. To facilitate that, what we have done, we have cancelled all our electives to free staff to look after children who need the most. And we have also optimised our ventilator capa uh, capacity if need be. And our staff are briefed daily by our CEO so that they are wholly supportive of what is needed and, and for, for the well-being of our children. And uh, our HR is providing support for our staff in terms of their well-being and resilience. Thank you. Any, any, any questions for Amy Round uh, with reference to Alder Hay? Any comments? No? Okay. Um, well, I, I think if we um, do then move on to you, Debbie, you're going to give us an update from the Royals' perspective. Okay, um, good afternoon everybody. I'm Debbie Herring. I am the Chief People Officer and the Deputy Chief Executive for Liverpool University Hospitals now. So I'm speaking on behalf of the Royal site and the Aintree site. So all of the things that I'm going to um, update on now apply across um, both of the acute sites across the city. Um, just for a couple, a couple of areas. First of all, about building capacity and capability and just to give assurance of where we are. Um, <clears throat> We do recognise this is going to be a significant challenge for us, um, maybe an unprecedented challenge, depending on how quickly um, the, the virus um, uh, you know, escalates over the next coming weeks. But we are well prepared, and we have got, obviously, long-standing plans, that we, emergency planning plans, that we've put in place. We are working very closely with our colleagues across the system as part of that Merseyside Resilience Forum to make sure that we have maximised all of our capacity and also our staff to be able to deal with the situation as it progresses. So we have um, got an incident room that's been established that is up and running 24-7, given coordination across the two hospital sites. In addition, we have daily executive oversight every day um, to ensure that any decisions that need to be taken are made very quickly. Um, in addition to that, what we're trying to do at the moment is we're setting up two streams. We're having a, if you like, I'll call it a clean stream um, for patients who don't have any symptoms um, of uh, coronavirus at all. And we're setting up a corona stream and we're doing that in both, across both sites um, and that will run right the way through from A&E right the way through to discharge so that we are trying to keep those two streams of patients separate uh, where we can. We are maximising our ICU and ventilation capacity and we're working very closely um, with colleagues at specialist trusts and other trusts across the system and also at the CCG and primary care to look at how we maximise uh, the facilities that we have um, so that we're able to bring different facilities online as and when we need them, depending on the number of people who need those respiratory services and uh, increased oxygen, etc. Um, in terms of uh, other things we're doing, um, what we have been doing is cancelling uh, a lot of non-urgent appointments. So that's both elective inpatient appointments. We are cancelling most of those. The only things that will be going ahead are obviously we're trying to keep our suspected cancer pathway and cancer pathways open as long as we can um, to make sure that any patients needing urgent treatment or cancer uh, surgery can have that uh, over the next week, coming weeks. Every case is being managed through an MDT approach to make sure that that is the most appropriate thing for those patients. 
Um, we're doing the same with outpatient appointments again, trying to cancel all unnecessary um, outpatient appointments at this time and also follow up appointments as well. Um, to, so that we can release really the staff more than the physical capacity at this point to be able to move those staff and to mobilise them to help with um, our, our, our emergency uh, wards and uh, A&E and ICU. That includes our theatre staff because we've obviously got theatre staff we're very highly trained and uh, operating department practitioners who are highly trained as well who can help um, with some of those patients needing ventilation or uh, airways management. <clears throat> We've also uh, restricting visiting, and that's taken place from today. So at the moment, we're following national guidelines. We're trying to follow national guidelines on everything that we're doing. Um, but particularly with visiting, we're reducing visiting to the hours of 6 to 7 p.m. at the moment. That's across all of our sites. And we're limiting it to one visitor per patient. And what we're trying to do the rest of the time is more or less lock down um, the wards, etc., um, so that staff are not in the position where they're having to deal with people turning up uh, ad hoc, and that we're doing everything we can to reduce footfall uh, in the clinical areas where possible. We're looking at patients who may be uh, at the end of their lives and their visitors and family to make sure that we can sympathetically support them, but that's the only difference from that. That situation may change over the next few weeks, but we're following national guidelines. With regard to staffing, we obviously have wanted to provide a lot of support for our staff at this time. We are down on staff in numbers, but I don't think as significantly as was reported by the council earlier. We're keeping an eye on that in terms of those who are off sick because they have symptoms, those who are off sick self-isolating, and um, those who are off for other reasons. We're obviously making sure we look after our own staff who do have um, significant health conditions themselves and also our pregnant staff doing risk assessments in those areas to try and protect them as much as possible. But the aim is to try and keep staff in work as, as much as we possibly can um, so that we can provide those vital services. Um, we're working with our staff around at the moment looking at the, obviously the closure of the schools, what school places will be available, where they are and how we can maximise those particularly for key workers and that's something that's urgent priority for us for next week to make sure that you know, the majority of our staff can continue to come into work. We're also looking at accommodation for staff, hotel accommodation, and as Louise mentioned earlier, university accommodation. And I have to say, we've been inundated with offers of support for that, so we're just trying to coordinate that now to make that available for staff um, across the board. One issue that may come up, I think, as we move forward as well, is transport. Um, and a number of staff, we've been doing a lot of briefings for staff over the last two days, and they've asked a lot about what happens if public transport reduces um, and there are restrictions on transport, so we're looking at what we can do to make sure they can uh, get, the, get to and from work and be supported. Um, we're using IT, we're trying to use our IT to maximum capacity. That includes virtual clinics, virtual meetings, and also looking at how we can support those staff who don't need to be in work to work from home. That's including reporting as well as the radiology report and extending that, etc., as well, to make sure we can get results back to patients. Um, as quickly as possible. Um, they are the main things, but as I say, the, the most important thing is keeping the front line going. And obviously, we do thank everybody for all the support in helping us with our planning. Happy to take any questions. Okay, Debbie, the Chief Executive is just going to respond to some of the points you made, but I think it's important that you uh, make us aware of some of the challenges that you face so we can see if there's ways that we can help you. That's great, so. thank you. Just on that, um, with regard to things like accommodation, um, including hotels and transport, uh, we're looking at this across the whole system and we're very happy to, to work very closely with you and other NHS colleagues to make sure we can oil the wheels to keep everything moving as efficiently and productively as possible. And, and in particular around those areas that, that uh, Tony's just mentioned, you know, around transport, if there yeah. is issues there, then, yeah. you know, we've got... Uh, transport issues ourselves which are now a little bit freed up with kids not being transported to school so possibly we can look at how we can support you uh, but the point is is that if you let us know Colleen uh, what your challenges are then we'll see what we 
can do to help you as well. Can I just ask in, in terms of, and, and I mentioned it to, to, the, uh, to Tony this morning and to Colleen, I think, well, because um, again, it, it's, it's amazing and brilliant that we're getting uh, offers of assistance and help and somebody, um, obviously, but we're waiting for the announcements of who's key workers and, and, and stuff, whatever, not just in the NHS, but outside the NHS. But somebody was asking us and, and talking to me about uh, nursery provision mm -hmm. uh, and the fact that, that you know, there, there is nursery provision being used by NHS staff. And as the pressure and the demand on staff becomes more, for instance, you know, to be uh, more, more pressure and more requirements of you to have your staff in, you know, working more or less at a, a 72 hour system in a 24 hour day, that's how much pressure, you know, we imagine you're going to be under. Is there a need and a requirement, for instance, for, for nursery provision to be extended beyond just 12 hours, normally eight to eight or whatever? So it's a 24 hour system. So, so that we can support health workers if they've got young children or whatever to see if that helps them help them be more in work so again i'm just throwing that out there if there is a requirement and there is a need there are people out there who are asking to see if they can assist and that means that all we need to do is extend the license and our planning mm -hmm. system to help them cope with that so it's about communicating as well yeah. so if you think that's an issue that we can help then again, if you let Steve or, or Colleen know, then that's something that we can look at as well. Yeah. Okay. Any um, uh, questions for Debbie from anybody? Yeah, Richard. The mayor alluded in his opening comments to the fact that one of the things we can do is to try and get people out of the hospital on your behalf, but delayed discharge normally counts for about 10% of your beds at any one time, if not more. Uh, are there any particular delayed discharges, blockages now that you think we could help with? And given the fact that we often are moving out of hospitals into our care or other care, people who are still fragile but not clinically ill, are you having to change your criteria for who and how you discharge into whatever other services uh, are available? Um, I'm not aware that, that we're su suffering from particular problems at the moment any more than we normally do in terms of discharge. And we've been working very, very closely with colleagues in adult social care to try to make sure that we get patient flow. What I think is quite interesting is from the public responses that we're seeing actually lower levels of patients coming in through uh, to A&E. So I think people are actually you know, taking on board the messages that actually if you can stay, be at home, it's safer. Um, I think the, the main thing is I think people understanding around the step down really and, the, and, and how we step down patients who've been in hospital now, particularly as more patients um, perhaps are, of, of, have either got or had COVID or maybe symptomatic. And so certainly at our briefings for staff, we've had a lot of questions about how do we discharge patients? How do we move them? How do we work with the community to make sure that they are streamed appropriately, that, people ha that they have the right PPE? And it's something we need to keep an eye on, I think. Particularly, I think, with the nursing homes to make sure that they you know, are, are working closely with us, that it's, it's seamless, that um, they are not, um, you know, more worried than they should be about taking patients back when patients are discharged, etc. They're the areas that I think are co we've been asked questions about and where we need to make sure as a system we're working very closely. But as of, of now, we're certainly not experiencing any you know, increases in delayed discharges or things than, we, than we've had previously. If anything, I think we're seeing you know, signs that we've, we've got less de discharge, delayed discharges. I don't know whether any of my colleagues want to comment on that. Councillor Brandt. Thank, <coughs> thanks, Mayor. Uh, Councillor Paul Brandt, Cabinet Member for Health and Adult Social Care. There are lots of ongoing discussions with our partners in the uh, care home sector about precisely this issue to make sure that we can um, flex the current system to ensure that it, um, it, it continues to flow smoothly uh, with, the, uh, with the challenging circumstances that we know are going to come on stream in the next few weeks. I, I uh, can only pass on my thanks to those care workers out there in the system at the moment, both providing domiciliary care and also providing assistance in nursing and residential homes. They are at the forefront of our concerns as a council and we are 
making sure that we are putting pressure nationally to make sure that they are qualified as key workers for the purposes of receiving support uh, so that they can continue in work and keeping that part of the health and social care system functioning properly and that they also are priorities when new resources in terms of uh, testing and PPE come on Line. So we are doing up with that. That is an ongoing discussion, and we are having daily contact with our partners in the social care system to make sure that system continues to work properly. And I'm pleased to say those relationships are strong, and we are continuing to meet the expectations of people at the moment. And we will endeavour to continue to do so. But it's an obviously an ongoing partnership between us, our care providers, and the NHS. Okay, thanks for those comments, Paul. And um, I, um, I'm now um, going to ask Colin from LCBS, who's here, if it, Colin wants to make any comments, and then I'm going to open it up to people as well from the voluntary sector and other councillors or, or, or whatever, uh, and anybody to make a comment. I'm mindful of the, of the time, so we want to try and finish it about around about four o'clock, if that's possible. Colin. Okay, thanks, Mayor Anderson. I'm Colin Haney, Chief Exec at LCBS. Um, I'll keep it brief. I've got uh, just a few points. Uh, the first one is we've been really happy to be working with Colleen and Tris on, on the community plans. Um, and our role in that really is to make sure that the wider voluntary sector has that information and buys into that. Because one of the issues at the moment, of course, is a lot of those voluntary sector organisations can't deliver their normal programmes. So there'll be people, there'll be resources. And can we change the way in which people are delivering their services, can they do other things? And the response so far has been really positive, so we're really grateful for that, and we'll have to see how that, that works. Parallel to that, there is an issue around some of those voluntary sector organisations. They're going to struggle financially over the next few months, so we're working locally and nationally with funders to see if there's any way we can bring resources into the system now, not in six months' time, to shore up some of those organisations, because Tony and Joe and others have mentioned the fact how important it is that those frontline trusted organisations are there and working effectively. But a lot of them work on a shoestring, and so we're looking at ways of doing that, and some local funders are already talking about how we might do that. We will obviously get information out to those groups about any new funding that comes on stream, emergency funds and things like that as, as we go through. We're working with national funders and local funders so that organisations aren't sanctioned if they can't deliver. So we're hoping that funders will go along with that and most are signing up to a national statement around that. So we're hopeful that's not a, a problem. Um, at LCBS, we're looking at ways we can use our resource more effectively and our staff more effectively. Um, so we'll be available if organisations need any additional support around volunteering or around their running costs, or around just general information. It's been touched on once or twice today about the need for the safeguarding message to be visible throughout all of this, because it's great to see people wanting to help, but we really do need to make sure that without putting people off, everyone knows that there will be checks in place to make sure that no one can be targeted. And we're going to, uh, we're going to be pushing that as we encourage people to sign up. Um, I suppose the last thing to say, I guess, is um, one of the things that we've noticed recently um, within the sector is the partnership working that's gone on has been really, um, people have been really proactive about that. And I'm going to be optimistic now and think that as we come on, out the other side of this, there's been changes in practice, there's been changes in the way people have done their business and worked. And we're going to need to sustain that post this because the world will be a different place. And I think that's just something to think about as we go forward, that some of the things that we're doing now are really effective and really important. And it'd be a real shame if we went back to our safe place when this is over. OK, th th thanks, um, Colin, for that. I, it just just comment from me in relation to some of the points you made there. Yeah, absolutely uh, spot on. And that was the concern that we uh, had uh, um, and when we set up the, uh, the helplines uh, and trying to coordinate this was to make sure that um, uh, this was done in a proper way. Um, and the need for um, checks uh, and, and, um, and also to make sure that, that the right people are doing the right things is still crucial. And, and so that's going to be at the forefront. So I thank Colleen and Tris, uh, and, and I know, and, and in particular, 
LCVS and the way they've uh, responded. Because I know, you know, there was an issue of us doing things rather than joining it up, but we had to show the lead and we had to, to do that. So apologies if people felt that we were, um, we were doing things a little bit disjointed. It wasn't. It was to make sure that those messages uh, were very much out there. In regards to, uh, to the funding, look, you know, there is a £500 million um, sort of, uh, crisis fund that's been set up by the government. Um, I make this uh, uh, call. If the voluntary sector needs support and funding, uh, then we can, you know, uh, support them. And then we can always try to claim uh, some of that money back through the, the crisis fund. That's what uh, we were told by the Minister on Monday, uh, uh, Robert Jenrick, uh, that, that that's what we should do. That's what we will do. So if there's a requirement uh, for support and funding, then, you know, let's get on with it. Let's, let's see what it is. Let's talk about what it is. And let's crack on and do it. And the point about what happens post this is a good point because we've got to make sure that we come out of this much stronger uh, in terms of how we respond and how we react uh, in, in, in the future. OK, so, Jane. I just wanted to say thank you to Colin, because I know LCVS themselves are under pressure, um, and it's really helpful to have that network in place, and there's a lot, so many trusted relationships there that have been there down the years for 30, 40, 50 years now that have gone right through organisations. Um, and also good to hear that you're talking uh, with and about small voluntary organisations who are running on a shoestring, who are trusted, and the people, mostly volunteers, will keep going until they drop, which is a danger in itself in terms of public health. Um, so just thanks a million. Also, the, the, the lovely Liverpool Play Partnership, which we've been working together for years now on with Play Schemes and the Food, together so it's, it's dignity self-respect no labeling that is going to have to remodel itself very very quickly and i know you're already looking at that and ways of doing play so that the kids who are trapped quite often now in in their own homes and worried about going out and particularly children with special needs and um, but anything around that i know you and kevin are working hard on that but any wild and wacky ideas of getting play stuff into homes would be brilliant Okay, and I'm sure you'll have a look at that and come back to us if there's anything there, especially that we can do. Okay, um, I'm going to ask um, Martin Farron, uh, who's our Adult Social Services Director, to see if he wants to make a uh, comment or contribution. Yeah, just try and keep it brief. I, I think the first thing I want to say is, is just for everybody to know how fantastic a response we have had across the, the whole of the social care sector, in particular the independent sector providers. There are some providers who are struggling a bit more, but the vast majority are still accepting referrals and still taking on new cases, and they are under extreme pressure. So overall, a brilliant response. We are maintaining service. I think one of the things we need to speak about, and obviously my colleague Steve has been doing a lot of work with schools around how we're going to provide cover so that people can still come and maintain those roles, but it is something that we'll pick up with our health colleagues around how do we support that decanting from the hospitals and so on. Um, I think that one of the things I also want to make clear is Liverpool Council were fairly uh, hot off the, the blocks in terms of confirming to providers that we would maintain payments to providers on a 12-month average of the last period so that we could maintain capacity, pay people. Hopefully, if people are incapacitated, they're only off for a short time. I've got to say that I explained that to the directors in the other authorities in Merseyside and they've agreed to take the same stance, which will help, which will help providers who work across boundaries, and I think that that's really positive. There is a quid pro quo. The expectation is mutual aid and that people then work together as a system. I've got to say the providers were already there in front of us and the offers that we've had of people to be freed up has been great. Um, we are also putting an ask out to families and the work that Collins mentioned with communities and the voluntary sector around lower level provision. Are there things that people could do that don't require social care professionals to be involved in that we could provide in different ways? And some of that is going to mean providing basics such as food provision, particularly some of those in, in most need. And I think uh, the mayor made very clear earlier about how do we ensure that there is equal access to some of these things so those who are the most needy don't get left out. Uh, we are reviewing services. There will be changes in services because capacity is very difficult to judge as people start to become unwell. 
the vast majority of what we're dealing with actually is planning for COVID. People actually aren't going off in big numbers. These are the people who are at risk. We haven't even got to when the people who are actually ill, and I think that's something to think about. We are certainly hitting in some services 30% of people already missing because they are in the at-risk groups. Um, so I think we need a short-term and a longer-term plan. In the longer-term plan, we are looking to, and I think it's, it again picks up on what the Mayor mentioned earlier, which I think is around how we could take, pick up people from other industries who've got skill sets who could come and help us, whether that's from cooks providing support in residential facilities or whether it's people actually getting out there and providing hands-on care. Uh, that access, which uh, Fiona mentioned to personal protective equipment, is an issue. I think one of the issues I want to, to people to understand here is what you see in the press and what you hear uh, and the reality of some two different things. Our providers are struggling to access uh, personal protective equipment. Um, it has all been siphoned off and gone to a central place that has had issues. At the moment, we've been told they'll get 300 masks to each place, but they haven't actually said what about all the other equipment, so that's a big issue for us at the moment. And one of the key areas for me is what we're doing around homelessness. We've maintained services. We've still got the same services going on and available, but we are also developing plans. I've got to, again, say the hospitality industry have stepped forward and offered us use. We are looking at a plan to potentially look at closing Labre House and moving the service. So it's not closing the service, it's moving the service because the people would be so at risk in that place. And we, we will look at that in the next couple of weeks. So I think overall, I just want people to get a positive. We are in crisis, but we're not panicking and we are delivering. Thank you for that, Martin. Thanks for that update. So, um, I, I guess it, it, I'm, I'm just going to now open. Um, we've got the, the, I, I think Chris, I don't know whether Chris, you want to give, give any comments from the police in, in terms of, um, you know, from your perspective in terms of where we're at and at the organ. Yeah, sure. Do you want to? Thank you, Mayor. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Chief Superintendent Chris Gibson from uh, Merseyside Police. I'm Head of People Services. I think. Colleagues have covered the Resilience Forum and where we are. Uh, we're in a really sort of positive place um, and essentially we're looking at maintaining and enhancing in some cases essential services as we move into sort of warm and form and then I know it seems a long way away but hopefully a, a response phase as well. In relation to, to us in, and our front our frontline service, uh, just to reassure you we haven't seen a reduction in, in the number of frontline officers who are responding to calls for service, so obviously, like yourselves, our business continuity plans are in place, um, and we're in a really sort of healthy position in terms of numbers that we can bring in when we need to in the future. We, like yourselves and like other colleagues, we've, we've been inundated with offers for, from retired officers and volunteers to come and to come and help us, which is is fantastic. In terms of calls for service into Merseyside Police, we haven't seen much difference really in terms of of the nature. In fact, in some areas, we've seen a reduction over recent days and, and you would expect that really in terms of less people are out and about in society so we've seen reductions in things like road traffic collisions and within the nighttime economy calls for service but we do anticipate as we move through this phase that we may see increases in domestic abuse unfortunately in other areas like that so we're gearing our plans up there likewise a very small section of society and the vulnerable in relation to crime prevention advice and some some uh, quite a lot of work going on at the moment around targeted crime prevention advice because we have seen a very small increase in the number of scammers who will surface at this time of year and prey on the vulnerable. But that said, we need to balance that with the amount of generosity and kindness that we're seeing out there as well, the vast majority of people who want to help in a community setting. So, so as it stands, to reassure people again, um, no reduction in, in frontline numbers and business continuity plans are holding up well and i'll take any questions Matt. you know i think that's it's good it's good to hear um the comments and, and again some of the points you've made there it, it, it's uh, expected isn't it you know i mean as i just walked up from my office down here it was like a sunday uh, less traffic less people out in the street so it's it's obvious that we're going to see less street uh, activity in crime and stuff whatever so um, okay, I've got two questions. Oh, okay, William. 
Uh, Councillor William Short, Old, Old Swan Ward. Um, a question I'd like to ask. I, would, I was today at a, a food bank today in Old Swan, and it's a really vital service. If people are uh, having um, uh, a downturn in the economy and the people are losing their jobs and they need somewhere to turn, the, these services are often open once, once, a, uh, once a week, which is a Thursday for, for Old Swan. Is there any chance that we could have these open at least twice a week? Or, for, or, for which service, Bill? Uh, I miss a, you? a food bank. Um, food bank. It's food bank, yeah. It's only open once a week. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, it's only open once a week. Um, um, this is a vital service that we need here. So I'm thinking if people are, are losing their jobs or people have to go in a crisis to the council, maybe we could, because it's staffed by volunteers, by okay. the way. Uh, okay. And those volunteers sometimes have children themselves. Okay. So, so in, in relation to, you, you know, we're, we're, we're devising and coming up with and working with the voluntary sector and ourselves and stuff, a, f a food strategy. We're working with uh, some of the food banks. Some of the food banks are going to close because uh, of the staff and stuff, whatever. So we're working with them. We're pulling together uh, things and we're very conscious of the fact that uh, there will be more and more people requiring uh, more support. But bottom line is through the telephone lines and through our own contacts in the voluntary uh, uh, sector operating in those particular areas that will identify them. Um, and so it, if it's necessary uh, to um, get deliveries to people and get support to people, uh, we will be doing that. So you and your colleagues in that area and other people play a vital role in feeding that back to us because what I do say and what I said earlier on is that nobody will be left hungry in this city. No one will be left without the resources and what they need uh, to, to get by. So, But that will be part of the food uh, strategy in terms of how we're going to be doing that. We'll reveal more over the next, the next couple of days as well. Jane? <coughs> So just on that, there was a really good meeting yesterday on the emergency part of the food strategy um, and looking at how referrals are done rather than paper vouchers and looking at distribution, looking at extra volunteers and trying to keep as many of the Trussell Trust food uh, centres open. Because what, we, what we've got to be aware of is that we can't create a gathering point for people where they will come in, transfer the virus between each other, get the food and go back out again. Um, so that's all being looked at really carefully. We had public health um, involved in that as well. Uh, could I just ask Chris a, a, a question on, in terms of the impact of, of children and young people, uh, schools closing, senior schools closing, um, youth clubs um, closing, play schemes not being able to function. Uh, there is an issue there about county lines or so-called county lines, exploitation of children. Um, so I'm just, I'm just flagging that up, um, and I know it, it's a difficult one to take on board on the different layers, but it, but it, is, it, it could well be used by the, the, the drug dealers. And also, Joe, just to say the fantastic job that you've done in terms of recently of getting right on top of the big, big dealers. So that's been all over the echo, and that's been amazing. Thank you. That's really kind comments. And, and yeah, you're quite right. You know, we, we're not really sure as we move into this phase what that means in terms of, you know, children's footprint on society. Are they going to, you know, we already have an Xbox society, don't we? We're going to see more children staying in or are we going to see the vulnerable now emerge on the streets for more hours in the day? And it's, you know, that, that, that will become, um, we'll, we'll see more of that over the coming weeks, I guess. But in relation to our neighbourhood footprint and engaging with, with children who are on the street, you won't see a reduction in that, so we'll still have that sort of street-based engagement to be able to identify the vulnerable and, uh, and divert to other services if need be. So. Okay, Paul. Thanks, Mary. I know we're coming to a close, so I just wanted to make two swift points, if I may. The first is to say that if anybody needs help or wants to volunteer, the Council's webpage, the coronavirus webpage, has um, buttons you can click on which enable you to enter your details and, um, uh, 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 and we will make sure that you are put in touch with the right people. And secondly, just to say, whilst many, many people are behaving incredibly responsibly, um, there are some who are not following the guidance on social distancing. I think we need to be absolutely clear. You should not be socialising unless it is absolutely necessary. And for those people who are going out to the pub with their friends or sitting in big groups in restaurants or bars, you need to ask yourself, is that absolutely necessary? And even if you think, or, or if you're going to the gym, for example, 
um, with lots of other people. Even if you think that this virus won't affect you, it will. But even if you think you're fit and healthy and can survive it, if you become infected, you increase the risk of everybody else in the community becoming infected, and in particular, your mum, your dad, your granddad, your nan, your auntie. Those people, if they get infected now, will be entering the health service at a period of its maximum stress. You are putting them at risk as well as yourself. Please don't do it. Please follow the guidance, because if you don't follow it, we all suffer as a society. Okay, thanks, Paul. Thanks for, for that. I'm going to take Tom and then Barry finally, and then a sum up. Thanks, Joe. Um, just a quick note about the phone lines. How many staff are there on those phone lines? Because I've received a couple of reports while we've been sitting here that it's difficult to get through, so I just wanted to know what the staffing levels were like. Okay, well, I, I, the, the numbers are... We, obviously, we've got to make sure that people have, have got some training uh, uh, around that. But um, I think we... I mean, obviously, I don't know the exact details yet, but uh, it, it, it will be uh, manned. I don't know... We are scaling up. I think there's about half a dozen people uh, on one line, half a dozen on the other, and that's going to be increased tomorrow as we get more and more people trained, but also as we bring in more staff from some of the services that we're reducing to train them up to get them on there. So hopefully it'll pick up, and, and in, in particular to meet the demand and the peak. That's the most important thing. So just on that, I imagine that right now the numbers come out, it's going to be a surge. So they just have to wait and see as well what the pattern is going to be. But the, just in terms of children, you know, work with children is carrying on. So although we're, there's a reduction in the staff, we're having to prioritise um, which children that we're going to work with. But between the schools and our children's centre staff that we are redirecting uh, from the work that they're doing and with our uh, social work staff, you know, we will be maintaining regular contact with young people who are vulnerable from school, particularly children with, um, who, with uh, SEND, so that, and those that are particularly vulnerable, and also we'll encourage that support as well where we can within, with, you know, within community. So that still will go on. Uh, yeah, thanks, Mayor. Just very quickly, um, working really hard with school leaders all today, and by the end of today we'll be circulating information on which schools uh, will be open next week, um, so that information will come out. And a very positive meeting with NHS leaders yesterday, and they're providing their information on their staffing demand in terms of childcare and other things. And just very briefly, just to pay, um, recognise and pay testament to the fantastic work our school leaders and school staff have done this last week. Uh, they've been fantastic. Okay, no, and I think we all echo that um, uh, uh, as well. So. I mean, the, there are no other uh, points being made. So, look, I, I, I think, you know, it's been a good meeting. I think probably, you know, sitting in this grand uh, chamber here, um, which is over 100 years old, I don't think uh, the city has ever faced um, the dilemma that it's going to be facing, the problems that it's going to be facing, the challenges it's going to be facing over the next uh, few months of that, I am absolutely sure. Um, and what it is, as, as somebody said, unprecedented, it is uh, unknown, uh, and that's where we are heading into the unknown. I think Councillor Brandt summed it up uh, really well uh, when he was uh, asking and pleading to people to take the advice and, and to do the things that we're being asking to do. Uh, and that message we've got to, all of us uh, as community representatives, as leaders in organisations, is make sure that we are given that message. I, uh, in, in some senses, end where I started by saying that, you know, this is um, a challenge that, that we face and we will, uh, with the spirit of this city, what we've always shown in adversity, uh, that we will come through it. We will. Nobody will go left isolated, alone or hungry. We will make sure of that and we will do everything we can to mitigate uh, the consequences of what this disease means to people. We'll do utmost everything uh, we can uh, to make sure that we limit the damage to it. So I want to thank every organisation, every single organisation, voluntary sector, statutory organisations for 
everything that you are currently doing and the demands that we're going to be putting on you moving forward. So thank you all uh, and we will keep you in touch. I'm not so sure when we'll call the next meeting, but we will keep you informed and in touch as we move forward, okay? So thank you for being here. Thank you.